Hello everyone, welcome back to the Junamax space program, Lor no, Lorenzo space program with the Junamax rocket. This episode is number 10 and it might as well be the curse of this Junamax. The uh, rocket has been blowing up every which way ever since its inception, it's not a very successful program. Only had 12 casualties so far. And as you can see, there are a lot of struts everywhere. Now, since the previous incarnation, I've added a few more, especially here in this area where the rocket broke apart. Previously, I've fast-forwarded time, so we have a dawn launch, because I have been I have become superstitious and have decided that the night launches the night launches have been causing all these problems. So the engineers have waited until daylight. We have a nice tall shadow on all the buildings and of course the rocket itself, and we are going to go for liftoff and see if we can get into orbit this time with a rocket that could theoretically make it to Juna. So, ready for launch, and here we go. Activating the stability system, so we go up straight, and fingers crossed and breaths hold, held everywhere. Fingers crossed and breaths held. So, this rocket, pray to the gods of dawn that it reaches orbit and not have some stupid mishap blow up again. Watching the overheat, of course, this is not a completely autopilot rocket by any stretch of the imagination. There are many things that have to be managed, the throttle being one of them. The full throttle setting is just a little bit too much for the connections to bear. So at least in the beginning, in the thick atmosphere, we are going for a lower than maximum amount of throttle. The speed is alright for this altitude. We could be going a slightly, slightly faster, but that would of course mean more aerodynamic drag and more stress on the rocket. We can see it's wobbling slightly. Boosters have ran out and we're dumping them, of course. You can see it's wobbling slightly. This is the automatic system keeping it stable, keeping it pointing straight up. Now, we see the rocket nozzles are glowing red with all the, f uh, all the burned up fires that are propelling us up into space. Everything so far is looking great. Stability system is holding. We're at 200 meters per second ascending past the 10 kilometer mark. If we're at 20, I'm going to try and attempt a slight pitch over maneuver. Because remember, to get into orbit, you don't just you don't just go straight up. You have to go sideways as well. Ideally, you do it a little bit sooner. But with this rocket, the air resistance has been causing a lot of trouble, so I don't dare to. Going for a slightly more inefficient, a slightly safer trajectory, because I'm, quite frankly, fed up with all the failures and want to get a flag on Juna and Ike, its moon. We have the two landers here, they will uh, serve that purpose, and the main command pod has a big parachute, allowing it to land on Mars, Juna in this game, or, if everything allows, and the fuel the reserves are, if, if we have enough fuel, we might be able to go somewhere else with just a command pod. While I'm talking, we've gone a little over 25 kilometers either, so about time to pitch over. Throttling back until about half throttle. Don't need as much power during the turn, and we want to be safe, remember? So going for about 45 degree angle. As in the previous launch, I want to go straight, or at least on a steady course, while I'm going to drop the outer boosters, so the engine doesn't run into them and explode. So I'm going to engage the stability system and keep this heading while the outer boosters run out. When they actually run out, I'm going to disengage the stability system because we don't want it wobbling around like right now. They have run out, separation and throttle up a little bit. This time I think everything went swimmingly. The boosters are separated, they did not collide with the engine and the rocket appears to be holding intact thanks to all the extra struts around the center here. So, I'm back at about 80% throttle and keeping this 45 degree angle. Starting to pitch over a little bit more now, we're almost at roughly 1000 meters per second, about a kilometer per second. Mighty fast, but still not fast enough to be considered orbital. So, we're going to burn out com this booster completely using the big inefficient engine. It's inefficient, but it has a lot of thrust. And then uh, when, it has, when it has burned out, we are going to finish the job using the four nuclear engines. Difference, of course, between a nuclear engine and a conventional engine is the conventional engine mixes fuel and oxidizer, burns it, much like uh, the gasoline and oxygen in your car do, and that creates heat and thrust. These nuclear engines have a nuclear reactor. The energy comes from uranium, presumably, or any other fissionable material, and then reaction mass in... In the, the in the case of the game, it's undefined, but in reality, it could be hydrogen or basically any other gas. Reaction mass is pumped through these reactors, heated up to steam or uh, plasma. It's heated up to it's it's flash heated to steam, which creates um, a lot of pressure if you eject it through a rocket nozzle. High pressure steam, and 
creates a nice rocket plume. In the game, the rocket plume is also, it, it has the same graphic as the fire plume, but in rea real life it would be like a wispy white jet, because there is no combustion going on, it's just hot gas being expanded through a nuclear reactor. Now, while I've been talking about this, this stage has almost run out, so we'll be seeing this shortly. Peeking at the map, our apoapsis is at 112 kilometers right now, and we are not at it yet, which is good because these nuclear engines will require some time to get up to speed. Because even though they're very efficient, they get a lot of power from their uh, reactor core, they are not very high thrust. And another effect they have, or another property they have really, so lighting the engines and separating the spent booster. Another thing they do, they only have a useful thrust in space really. In the atmosphere they do work obviously, but they don't work very well. And this is because uh, when you eject reaction mass, either from a chemical engine or from a nuclear engine, it needs to, uh, you want to push it away from the rocket as fast as possible. As and if you have to push away an atmosphere that's around the rocket as well, you're going to lose energy doing that. Um, imagine stepping on, uh, imagine s uh, stepping on a step plate and pushing off from it. If you can, no, this is a stupid analogy. Forget that. Forget that. Imagine having a rocket engine using reaction mass, and if you can throw it backwards and there's nothing in the way, you can get a lot of thrust from that. If you have to first push. Um, push away some water or some air or something, you're going to lose thrust pushing away that water, that air, instead of pushing the rocket. Well, in an atmosphere you of course have to push away the atmosphere, not only for the rocket but also for the exhaust. And that causes uh, energy loss, it causes a decrease in efficiency. Now with the big chemical engine, the difference in, the, the percentage-wise difference is not that big, because uh, there is a massive amount of reaction mass and a comparatively small amount of atmosphere that has to be pushed away. Um, because these nuclear engines are so efficient, they put a lot of energy in a relatively low amount of mass. They, this means they use a lot of they, they use a, a low amount of fuel, not a lot at all. Put a lot of energy in that fuel, so they do get usable thrust out of it. But the mass of the fuel, the mass of the expanded reaction mass, is very low. So if this encounters an atmosphere, it's going to be in trouble. Um, it's going to basically dissipate all the energy in the atmosphere and not a lot into the ship. So this only works in space, which is why we launch on big conventional boosters. As soon as these tanks are drained, these are the first tanks these engines are draining, they will be ejected. While I'm talking, I have angled the ship upwards a bit, because even though we are uh, not we are in space, we're not in orbit yet, and we have passed the apoapsis without establishing the orbit. So we need to th start thrusting upwards to not fall down. I hope, hope, hope we can manage this. This is a very inefficient way of establishing orbit, but if this is, if this turns out to be unfeasible, this whole rocket design needs to go back to the drawing board, because then we just need more engine power, more thrust on the first stages, and seeing how many struts this already needed, that, that's going to mean making a whole different new rocket, because there's nothing we can do with this design anymore. I hope, hope, hope we can make it. The orbital speed is still increasing, but we are. if you look at the vertical speed indicator, we are falling down to the planet. We are not fast enough to be considered in orbit. The circle is expanding. We are. If we would not encounter an atmosphere, we would eventually make it, but my fear is that we are going to fall into the atmosphere, and that will slow us down and ruin any dreams, any and all of our dreams of going to space today. This is the flag of our first great success, it's here on the bottom, we're passing over it, we, that we can see it means we are far too close. These indicators, they appear only within 100 kilometers. We are at this moment only 82 kilometers above the surface, and the atmosphere starts at 70. We can get away with going through it until about 60 kilometers, and then we will be slowed down too much to even consider achieving orbit. I think I'm even accelerating, falling out. These rockets do not even have enough thrust to lift the rocket itself. So we might have to ditch, if we ditch everything, maybe this will work out. So we're going to ditch this thing, we're going to, ooh, please, no, I've unbalanced it, and now we are going to turn around and sh shut down the engines. I should have ditched them uh, simultaneously, but that's not possible. Oh, I had it. I have to click on a tiny, tiny docking port, that's why it's going horribly wrong now. Decouple it. Oh. And now we go. Wow, it's 
really is too little too late. We are at 63 kilometers. We are, ironically enough, almost at orbital speeds. We're just doing it at the wrong place. And we have now also lost control of the rocket. I can barely control it anymore. We are now just over two kilometers a second. But as I said, hitting the atmosphere, not having a great time at it. You can see this line is almost on orbit, but not quite. This rocket is just too heavy. Ditching these fuel tanks, we should have ditched those first. Um, so now we are, instead of heading out merrily into space, we are heading back to Earth, back to Kerbin, at orbital velocity, which is not the point of this exercise. I'm considering what to do about this rocket, how to make it bigger, and I'm thinking of adding a fuel tank to the last booster. That should probably do it. And I am, of course, still going to thrust with these rockets in the vain hopes. We are a lot lighter now without the landers. This pod could still land somewhere, but I do think... No, no, we are never going to be able to recover this. We are at 30 kilometers. We're being slowed down very much by the air. If we had ditched the landers quicker, we could have made it. So that's one thing I can consider in the redesign, like making, um, like omitting a second lander, just having bringing the one lander. But that would mean giving up on the, on the the flag on the moon on Ike. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a lander that will land on Juna, I'll make one lander that lands on Ike, and I'm going to forego any return capability. So it's going to be one lander for Ike, one lander for uh, Juna for, uh, for Mars. And it's going to land using parachutes and it won't have a big rocket engine to blast it back off again. That is the rocket you will see in the next episode because this one, it's just not... I might do one more try with this one because I like the double lander design. But I'm going to need more thrust. I'm going to, I might have to add an, uh, another stage so that it will reach orbit and then it can use the nuclear engine because this there's so much fuel here I could reduce the amount of fuel for the for the nuclear engines yes that's what I'm going to try first not adding more fuel reducing it definitely so first save these people deploy the chute no more casualties today just a whole another big big expenditure of hardware so these guys have survived returning to the space center mm, wait Wait, wait, wait. No, not the tracking station. I, I can do that now. I can do that real quick. I can reduce the, reduce the amount of fuel they bring, which will probably solve everything. Just trying to have it be too heavy, getting a lot of boosters in, which will cause problems and everything. So this fuel tank has got to go, which means we are a bit lighter. Just a bit, but it might just be enough. We're going to try it like this because we made it just by a hair. If we didn't make it by a hair. So I'm going to try it without that fuel tank and see how we do. See how we do this time. Because we were oh so, oh so close. Well, another thing I'm going to do is going to shoot for a little higher trajectory so we get a little bit more space time for the nuclear en engines to burn. Uh, stability system on and launch. Yes, I'm feeling confident about this. Everything should go smoother without that extra mass. We should be able to launch quicker, we should be able to establish orbit quicker, and I think we will still have more than enough to make it to Juna, Ike, and uh, beyond. First though, this launch procedure is still very hairy. We still have to get through that. Um, but as soon as these first boosters are done, I'm feeling confident about it. We are accelerating faster. It might just be me, but I think everything is going a lot better without this extra half tank of fuel. We've deleted it from fairly high up in the rocket, so not having to lift it all the way will make a huge difference. If you add a booster in the first stage, it's not going to make that big of a difference, but if you modify something on top, it makes all the difference because that has to travel all the way. For instance, these boosters that I'm ditching now, they don't make that big of a difference. If I reduce their weight by half, we would maybe gain 300 meters or 50 meters per second delta V, something like that. If by removing this whole fuel tank, we might just make the difference of establishing orbit or not, or going to Juna or not, or doing something productive or just dying and crashing again. Our crew today, Franklin, Johnson, and Durfrot Kerman, 
they are not very confident. There have been 12 casualties so far, lots of crews that have ridden the rocket and survived, funnily enough. They have told their tales of woe, saw many rocket infernos pass by the windows of the command pod, but today everything is going to go great. Johnser brought his clover, his four clover, for luck, of course, and the designers assured them, this would be me, that the omission of the extra fuel they would certainly not need any more fuel than they're bringing already because they're not going home. They're going to stay on Ike, they're going to stay on Juna and perhaps the one guy in the capsule, he might have a shot of going home but that shot has been reduced severely. Fortunately these are Kerbals and they do not care. As long as they get somewhere they are happy. So we're at 25 kilometers now. I'm going to go up a little bit more because we need that space time not the space-time continuum, we need the time in space to establish orbit. Our projected apoapsis is now at 60 kilometers, so I'm going to just keep going straight up until these four boosters run out, and then with the remaining stack I'm going to pitch over. Throttling back a little bit because we're at 40 kilometers already, and... Ooh, geez, uh, high apoapsis is 110. I would have wanted to pitch over now, but I want to do the separation first. So, separation, and they're away safe and sound, going to start to pitch over now. And now, so far this flight looks very similar, except that we are just getting higher, going further on the same boosters, because we're carrying less stuff. It's not a lot less, I'd say about 10% less maybe, but that can just make all the difference, and I hope it does, because as I said before in the previous launch, I'm sick of these failures, and I want to send this crew on their way to Juna. We have flags to plant, we have places to go, on onwards and upwards as someone famous once said I'm sure and otherwise I'm saying it so pointing perpendicular to the horizon now trying to at any rate we're at 100 kilometers still going up we are f confidently into space and riding a full power mainsail engine you have to always have to keep you have to you have to steer very carefully in these kinds of arrangements because you're on a stick and there's a, a junction point here where it easily can break and you're steering by, by by angling a massively powerful rocket. So if you do it too violently, too abruptly, the thing will just break in two and you will not be going to space today. Or in fact, we are already in space, but you would just tumble back home as happened in the previous missions and you would be very unhappy. Not sure what's going on, but I think the rocket is unbalanced somehow. It looks fairly symmetrical, but it keeps wanting to go somewhere of its own accord. boosting to the sides now very very hard and with this booster we're at 1200 meters per second which is a lot slower as you as in the previous mission you might have noticed in the previous launch but we're also a bit a lot higher so our energy is either higher or the same um, because we're going higher our orbital speed needs to be lower so let me assure you we are still working on establishing orbit transferring to these nuclear engines now you can see the acceleration has just plummeted it's a lot lot lower now but we are on these efficient engines and this fuel will just last forever. So we can do this a long time and hopefully we have a long time. Because as we see our apoapsis now is 200 kilometers. And we're at 170 now and still rising. So thrusting perpendicular to the planet and hopefully this time around we are going to make orbit. I'm going to throw in a quick save. And repower the engines. Powering down the engines for saving because you cannot save in this game while your ship is under acceleration. You can only save when it's uh, ballistic, when it's just drifting under no outside force. And we're going to keep an eye on these fuel tanks because these are the first ones to be drained and as soon as they are drained I want to detach them and uh, shed their weight because as I've been talking about a lot now carrying extra weight is no good and it won't make you go any further. So our speed is now almost constant this means we are roughly we're trading vertical speed roughly one to one with uh, horizontal speed and of course we're not trading it the vertical vector you can see it independently of the horizontal vector the vertical because we're uh, pointing completely horizontal is basically just uh, ballistics where we've thrown up the tennis ball and it's now near the near the peak of its trajectory and then it's going to fall down our engines are not doing anything for that our engines are only going to push us sideways the orbital velocity here is an aggregate of the two speeds so the, uh, while the change isn't much, we are definitely accelerating towards the horizon. And now you can see it, you visualize what an orbit is. We want to clear the horizon before we fall back into it. 
and as soon as we clear the horizon, because it's a sphere and our speed will then remain the same, we will keep clearing it forever and that will mean we are in orbit. If we take a sneak peek at the map, we are still not at our apoapsis of 215 kilometers at the moment and we need to add quite a bit more speed. You can see these lines creeping outwards slowly and this is the name of the game with these nuclear engines. Everything happens very slowly but it does so very efficiently. This rocket using chemical engines would have had us in orbit already, but would also have expended all the fuel. And since we're going to a faraway planet, we need a lot of delta V, we need a lot of efficiency. We are using it, we are doing it this way. So here's the nozzles glowing red hot with the hot hydrogen they're exhausting. Again, as I said before, the, the graphics here are actually wrong. You would not have a, a fiery plume on the back of a nuclear engine, you would just have a white hot, a uh, uh, wispy, steep. Uh, a wispy stream of steam, a stream of steam, Jesus, I try to say hard words. What is possible, these nuclear engines, by the way, they have been built in the real world, but they have never been flown. They have been flown in space, but they have not been used. So this is a little bit a slight science fiction They, in the way that we could, we could have built these engines. In fact, we have built them, but we have fl flown no missions with them in the real world. Of course, because that's because everyone on Earth here is very, very scared of radiation. Sissies and wimps that we are. One of the things that was theorized about, but that was never actually built, is an, uh, an hydrogen-oxygen afterburner. You would first superheat the hydrogen with the nuclear reaction, and then in the nozzle add some oxygen to then, then burn it. This would, of course, grant um, a hybrid between a chemical and a nuclear engine providing lower deficiency but still somewhat useful thrust so that these maneuvers would happen more quickly. Uh, this was never built. Anyway, returning to this maneuver in question, we are at our apoapsis now, slightly past it, but ooh, the ship's drifting of course, have to keep steering it. In the last stage I ejected the automatic guidance system, so the steering has got to be manual for now. Anyway, we are almost in orbit. And I'm, this time I'm definitely confident that we're going to make it. So that omitting that one tank of, a half tank of fuel really makes all the difference. And these tanks are almost empty and as soon as they are, they will be ejected. They have their little rocket motors that will shoot them away. So they won't collide with our fuel, our nuclear fuel engines either. And then the ship will be a trifle lighter again. So there they go. Bye bye tanks. And now we are in our final configuration. This tank has a lot of fuel, these four tanks have a little bit of fuel and they will carry us and the ship to Juna, is the plan at any rate. Then we have here the two tiny landers that will put our crew and our flags, that's all we care about really, the flags, down on Ike and Juna and then these systems, this, this system of planet and moon will be ours as well. So, as soon as we establish orbit, I'm going to go take a quick break and move on to the next episode, which will show you how to, how to plot an interplanetary transfer and how to then get there. This is uh, slightly trickier than going to the moon here, which is really close, and as I showed you before, Juna is quite a bit farther out, it's all the way over there. So, in the next episode, it's going to focus on how to do that, how to make an interplanetary transfer happen. And let's zoom in again, see if, first things first, are we in orbit yet? The answer is almost. Now, burn, I'm going to shut down the engines. If we burn prograde here along this axis, we will eventually push this periapsis up above 70. And of course, we need to put it up, push it up against above 70, because otherwise we're crashing back into the atmosphere. However, if we do it up away from the apoapsis, this one is going to rise also. Um, Ideally, we'd wait until the apoapsis, but we can't do that, obviously, because we'll be passing through the atmosphere. So what we're going to do is we're going to angle away from the planet and just boost straight up. This is not something you want to do reasonably, but I want to have a somewhat circular orbit, so that makes it a little bit easier to plot the interplanetary transfer. So I'm going to, again, trade a little bit of inefficiency for a little bit of custom-made orbit shaping. So I'm going to look at the map, look at the nav ball here, and we can control the ship from here. So I'm going to throttle up now, and we can see the periapsis is now rising, while the apoapsis is falling, which is not the greatest way to do it, because you ideally you're now basically just trading orbital energy from one end to the other. But I have no idea what I'm doing, I just realized. Anyway, by pointing the ship this way and firing the rockets, this point is going higher, this point is going lower, which is something we want.
We have this at 70, now 75. So now it's safe. Now we can just wait until we're back at the apoapsis at the highest point. And then we can make it a nice circular orbit. Because if you burn at, at the highest point at the apoapsis, the periapsis, the lowest point, will be the one that's affected. So I'm going to time warp now until we're there. First a quick save, because we are finally in orbit with the Junamax interplanetary flag planting mission. Not a moment too soon either. 12 casualties and lots of failed and damaged rockets. And in the end it was all because we were greedy and were bringing too much fuel. So time warping here now across the dark side at to our apoapsis, which is at 212 kilometers now, which is a good height to uh, plot a transfer orbit from. We're just going to wait until we arrive at that. The sun should be rising soonish. Yes, there it is. <coughs> Excuse me. So at 190 kilometers, we're just going to enjoy that view of the planet going over some desert. And these guys, Franklin, Johnson, and Durfrot, they're a little bit concerned, but they really actually are in orbit. So there's no reason to be too concerned. Everything is going to be fine. Trust me, trust me. Right, so at 212 kilometers we are going to do a quick burst to raise our periapsis to the same level. So time warping forward until that moment of 212, 1, 211, 211 and a half. And um, again I'm going to do this burn while looking at the map. So. This allows for quite precision maneuvers. So lighting the engines here and we can see the periapsis is immediately rising whereas the apoapsis stays virtually the same because we're almost on it. So at 100 kilometers... 130... As you can see these nuclear engines, they do take a long time to get anything done. This is also why we want to go for a slightly higher orbit then we could go for a 75 kilometer orbit for instance and do the transfer from there but as you can imagine the direction in which we leave the planet is fairly important if we're going to get that wrong even by a few degrees we're not going to hit Juna so by going to a slightly slightly higher orbit it takes longer to go around the planet it makes it possible to get a more accurate ejection trajectory even with the, especially with the nuclear rockets um, 200 might still be considered conservative. I'm going to, in the next episode, going to try it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to reload the quick save and try it from a slightly higher orbit, maybe 500 kilometers. Anyway, so far we've finally made orbit. In the next episode, we're going to try and get to Juna. As always, if you like the video, subscribe and like it. Talk to all your friends or just leave a comment. I like reading them. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll be seeing you guys next time.